from a great leader. In my role as an executive coach, I have a very unusual way of coaching. I don't get paid if my clients don't get better. Better is not judged by me. Better is not judged by my client. Better is judged by everyone around my client. This is a great way to test how someone actually believes what they're saying. You can ask a person one question and instantly determine their level of belief. And it's a very simple question. It always works. What is that simple question? Do you want to bet on it? If they say, I believe it, but I don't want to bet on it, you know what you just learned? I, they don't really believe it. If they say, here's the money, they believe it. Now, this is something I bet on every time. This is something I believe in. It's something that works. Now, when you get paid for results, you learn a little humility. The client I coached that I spent the most amount of time with did not improve at all, and I did not get paid. The client I spent the least amount of time with improved more than anyone I ever coached. 200 people probably got better, and I did get paid, and he was fantastic to start with. Very humbling experience. Well, I made a chart. On one dimension, it said, time spent with Marshall Goldsmith. The other dimension, improvement. There seemed to be a clear negative correlation between spending time with me and getting better. And I thought, that's a troubling chart. Now, I go talk to my client who improved the most, who I spent the least amount of time with, who's fantastic to start with. His name is Alan Wally. Alan is now the CEO of the Ford Motor Company, uh, CEO of the year in the United States. Fortune magazine just said he was number three leader in the world. He ranked only behind the Pope and Angela Merkel. So Alan is a pretty fantastic leader, and he's also just a great human being. So I go talk to Alan. I said, Alan, now of all the people I've coached, you improved the most, I've spent the least amount of time with you, and you were great to start with. What should I learn about coaching from you? By the way, I'm sitting there thinking about my chart, and I was thinking, if that guy never met me, the way this chart looks, he'd really be good. Well, I asked Alan, what should I learn about coaching from you? He taught me two great lessons I'm going to share with you. He said, Marshall, lesson number one, your biggest challenge as a coach is picking great customers. If you pick great customers, your coaching process is always going to work. And if you pick the wrong customer, your coaching process is never going to work. Work with great people. Pick great customers. And he said, number two, don't make the coaching process about yourself and your own ego and how smart you are. Make it about those great people you work with, how proud you are of them and how hard they work. Then he said, my job isn't that different as the CEO of this company. He said, I don't build these cars. I don't design the cars. I don't sell the cars. I've got to have great people here at Ford to help me. They're the ones doing the work. And he said, every day when I drive to work, I tell myself leadership is not about me. Leadership is about them. Well, these are some great learning points from a very, very great leader. And you know what? That applies in so much of our lives. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Most of us never deeply understand these points. Have you ever attempted to change the behavior of a successful adult that had absolutely no interest in changing? Uh, how much luck did you have in those religious conversion activities? Now I'm going to ask you another question, a troublesome question, yes, an embarrassing question. Have you ever attempted to change the behavior of a husband, wife, or partner that had no interest in changing? And how's that working out for you? How's this one? Have you ever attempted to change the behavior of mommy or daddy who had no interest in change? I was teaching my class at Dartmouth. The woman raised her hand. I said, who are you trying to change, mommy or daddy? She said, daddy. I said, what's old daddy's problem? She said, he does not have a healthy lifestyle. I said, how old is daddy? She said, 94 years old. I said, leave the old boy alone. I'm going to teach you a great lesson now for being a great coach. What is that lesson? In terms of coaching adults, if they do not care, do not waste your time. If they do not care, do not waste your time. How much of our lives have been wasted trying to change the behavior of adults that do not care? And what is our return on that investment? Now I'm going to give you a great lesson for developing yourself as a leader. What is that great lesson? If you do not care, do not waste your time. If you're going to get better at anything, the motivation for your improvement is going to come from one and only one place. Where would that be? In your heart. If it doesn't come from in here, you won't do it anyway. So in terms of coaching others, if they don't care, don't waste your time. In terms of coaching yourself, developing yourself as a leader, if you don't care, don't waste your time. The essence of being a great coach, pick the right customers, work with great people, work with people that care, and make sure that you realize your success is not a function of you. Your success is more a function of them.
feed forward. Now I'm going to teach you a very positive, upbeat way to help yourself get better, to help other people get better. It's a key component of my coaching process. It's called feed forward. Now in feed forward, you're in two roles. Role number one is called learn as much as I can. And when I teach the classes, I always ask, are there smart people in this room? Everyone says, yes. I say, if you had a chance to learn from these smart people, would you like to do that? Everybody says, of course. Role two is help as much as I can. Then I ask, are there nice people in the room? Everybody says, yes. I said, if you had a chance to help these nice people, would you like to help them? And everybody says, yes, again. So I say, look, you're either going to be learning from these smart people, which is good, or helping these nice people, which is also good. Therefore, it is all good. Now, what are the rules of feed forward? Rule number one is no feedback about the past. No feedback about the past. We spend too much time in our lives talking about the past. Have you ever been impressed with your husband, wife, or partner's near photographic memory of your previous sins, which have been documented and will be shared with you in a repetitive and annoying way? Well, you know what? We can't change the past anyway. Rule one, no feedback about the past. Rule two is harder. You can't judge or critique ideas. In Feed Forward, you're asked to ask for input and listen to it without judging or critiquing. A good philosophy is, when I get an idea, I should treat it like a gift. Treat the idea like a gift. Now, if somebody gives me a gift, should I say, stinky gift, bad gift, I don't like your stupid gift. What should we say when somebody gives us a gift? Thank you. Treat the input like a gift and you say thank you. Now, how does Feed Forward work? Well, you can do this with a team, a large group. I've done it from six to 6,000. Each person picks one area to improve. Not 30, not 50, not 100, one. And whatever they pick needs to come from their heart. Then each person says, my name is, I want to get better at. The other person gives them one or two very quick ideas for the future, no feedback about the past. They say, thank you. The other person says, my name is, I want to get better at. One or two quick ideas for the future, no feedback about the past, thank you. They shake hands and rush off and talk to another person. The goal is to talk to as many people as you can when I do this in a large group, maybe in five or six minutes. At the end of the exercise, I say to the group, I want you to complete this sentence with one word. This exercise was, and they all say positive, simple, helpful, even fun. What's the last word you think to describe any feedback activity? Fun. So anyone ever called you up and said, I have feedback for you, I'd like to have you come into my office. And you said, fun, fun, fun. Fun is the last word you think of. Yet when I do the feed forward exercise, no matter what country I'm in, 95% of the people say it's positive, useful, helpful, or even fun. Then I ask, why? Why do people see this as fun as opposed to painful? And they say, well, to start with, it's fast. One thing we do about coaching is we talk too much. And in this exercise, you learn to give one or two very quick ideas. Don't babble on. By the way, if I'm doing coaching, we often talk too much. I give you my best idea. Now I talk some more. My second best idea. I talk for an hour. My 75th best idea. What happens to the quality of our ideas? We keep babbling. They get worse and worse and worse. And you don't remember my first good idea. You remember my last stupid idea. Another term is it's simple. It's not too complicated. It's positive. It's focused on a future you can change, not a past you can't change anyway. Have you ever made a fool of yourself in front of important people before? How much fun is it to relive that event? Well, that's not a whole lot of fun. This is focused on what you can change, not what you can't change. Some other comments, no judging. I always tell the group, if I would have allowed you to judge or critique each other's comments, you'd have spent twice as much time debating about the comments as listening to the comments. How much do I learn proving you're wrong? Nothing. How much do I learn proving I'm right? Nothing. What percent of all interpersonal communication time is spent on somebody talking about how smart they are, how dumb somebody else is? About 65% of all time is wasted on that. Cut that out, life is much, much more positive. One gentleman said, I listen better in this speed forward exercise than I almost ever listen in my life. Ask him why. He said, normally when other people talk to me, I'm so busy composing my next comment to prove how smart I am, I am not really listening. I'm just composing. The irony, he had a Nobel Prize. A man with a Nobel Prize in a management class trying to prove he was smart. I said, look, you got one Nobel Prize, you're not going to win two, it's okay. Let's just declare victory here. Well, a couple of final points on Feed Forward that make this work. 
a common misconception of coaching is, I have to have a deep knowledge of you to help you. I've done this with groups of people who didn't even know each other, and they're shocked how much they learn. Sometimes we learn more from people we don't even know. They don't have stereotype, they don't have history, they don't have baggage. A bigger misconception of feed forward is, I have to be better than you to help you, or superior to you, or you have to be smarter than me to help me. Wrong. At the end of the exercise, when I work with large groups, I say, how many of you felt the need to say this to the people around you? I have your problem too. I have your problem too. I have your problem too. They almost all raise their hands. It doesn't matter what country I'm in. Even though our cultures are different, in here, we're not the difference. We're not that different on the inside. And most people say, I am amazed at how similar everyone else's issues are to my own issues. Well, we don't have to be better than others to help others. Better off being a fellow human being, stumbling through life without clear answers to tiny little questions like, who am I, where are we, and what is going on here? That's all we are anyway. We're not little gods. We're just little confused people stumbling around. What's great about Feed Forward is the whole focus is on helping each other, not judging each other. So if you look at Feed Forward, a very simple process. What do you learn? You learn to ask for input. You learn to listen non-defensively. You learn to say thank you and give people recognition for what they say. You treat it as a gift. You don't have to use the gift. You listen to it and you thank them for giving you the gift. And on the other end, you learn not to judge. You learn not to critique. What's great about Feed Forward is everyone is focused on helping everyone. No one is focused on judging everyone. Coaching for behavioral change. I like to talk about when behavioral coaching works, and just as importantly, when behavioral coaching does not work. First, when will behavioral coaching not work? When will my coaching process be a waste of time? Number one, my process does not help people that don't care. If somebody doesn't care, they don't want to try, this process is not going to help them get better. This is not for saving the unsavable. This process works for people that do care. So number one, they have to try. Number two, they have to be given a fair chance. Sometimes big companies write people off and they don't really give them a chance and they have this fake coaching process, which is not really about coaching. It's a thinly disguised seek and destroy activity. Well, if somebody doesn't really have a chance, they've been written off by the executives, don't coach them, be, be merciful, just fire them. Uh, number three, behavioral coaching only solves behavioral issues. It doesn't help intellectual, technical, or functional problems. I get ridiculous requests for coaching. I probably get 10 times as many requests for coaching as I have time to do it. And some of them are just nonsense. A pharmaceutical company calls me, Marshall, we'd like you to coach Dr. X. I said, what's his problem? They said, he's not updated on recent medical technology. I said, neither am I. Well, I can't make a bad doctor a good doctor, a bad scientist a good scientist, a bad engineer a good engineer. Behavioral coaching only solves behavioral problems. Next, never coach an ethics or integrity problem. If someone has an ethics or integrity problem, fire them, don't coach them. How many ethics problems does it take to ruin the reputation of your company? One, never coach ethics problems, fire ethics problems. And finally, this doesn't help someone who's going in the wrong strategy, the wrong direction. If somebody's going in the wrong direction, behavioral coaching only helps them get there faster. It doesn't turn the wrong direction to the right direction. Now, when will behavioral coaching work? Behavioral coaching works, at least my part of behavioral coaching, or my process works, if three conditions exist. One, the issue is behavioral. It is not intellectual, it's not technical, it's not functional, it's behavioral. Two, the person is willing to try. And three, they will be given a fair chance. If these three conditions exist, my coaching process always works. If these three conditions do not exist, do not use this process. It'll probably be a waste of time. So behavioral coaching, 70% of all requests for coaching, the issue is behavioral. The person is willing to try and they will be given a fair chance. This process really helps in that 70%.
coaching for behavioral change. I now like to share the steps in my behavioral coaching process and hopefully teach you how to use this process yourself. Now, what I love about my process of coaching, it is highly transferable. For example, GE has taught hundreds of people to use our coaching process and their results are just about as good as mine with their internal coaches. Thousands of people externally have been trained around the world to use our coaching process. And again, many of these people have fantastic results. This is a very, very transferable process. Now, I'm going to describe how I coach people. I'm going to use an example of someone who has the potential to be a CEO. In my own coaching, I either coach the CEO or I coach the future CEO. On the other hand, it doesn't really matter. This coaching process works just as well with first-line supervisors, second-line managers, works with every level of management. I'm going to give an example of how I coach people using a potential CEO and a CEO as my case study examples. Step one in the process. In my coaching, it's incredibly time efficient. What is the cost to my CEO or could-be CEO clients of hiring me? There's only one real cost, their time. Uh, one of my coaching clients has a company with a market cap of about $250 billion. What's his time worth? He doesn't need me to waste his valuable time. I don't get paid because I spend time. I get paid because I get results. The less time I spend to get the same results, the better it is for my clients and the better it is for me. So I'm not about wasting time. My process is incredibly efficient. Why is one of the reasons it's efficient? No arguing. Everything I do in my coaching is either required, and if something is required, there's no arguing. Do it or I refuse to work with you, or it's optional. And optional, there's no arguing. Do it if you want to do it. Feed forward, not feed back. Now first, let's talk about what's required. If I coach someone, you will get confidential feedback from everyone around you. It's not a vote. You will pick important behavior to improve. You will talk to people about what you learn, responding and involving these people. You will follow up on a regular basis with your coworkers. You will follow up with me. Your manager will agree, if you're not the CEO, that this is the right behavior and these are the right people. You will get measured twice, and then assuming that you get better, I get paid. And again, I don't get paid if my clients don't get better. How does the process work? Let us imagine I'm coaching a potential CEO, and here's the CEO. The first thing is what's required. I go through what's required. You have to get that confidential feedback. You have to talk to people. You have to follow up. You have to get measured. All these are required steps. If the person says, I don't want to do any of those things, what do I say? Goodbye. I'm not judging the person. I'm, no one made me guide this week. On the other hand, since I don't get paid if they don't get better, I have very low tolerance for wasting my time. Well, let's say the person says, yes, I want to do it. Now I bring in the CEO. And the person and their manager both have to agree, yes, this is a good process. Then the next step is the potential CEO and the CEO have to agree who are the key stakeholders. Now, these typically would be a peers, direct reports, manager, perhaps board members. I don't tell them who the stakeholders are. They tell me who the stakeholders are. So we reach an agreement, who are the key stakeholders? And my average client has about 18 key stakeholders. Nothing magic about 18. The least I've ever had is eight. The most I've ever had is 40. 18 is about the average amount. Then the next step is, once the stakeholders have been identified, I interview each of the key stakeholders and I ask them some questions. Question number one, what is this person doing well? And I write down the positives. Question number two, uh, what does this person need to change? What suggestions? Then number three, imagine you were this person's mentor, coach, or advisor on any topic, large to small. What advice would you have for this person? Well, I write a report. And as you can see, here's an example of what some of these comments might look like. The reports are very straightforward, and some might say very hard to hear sometimes. Well, I write the report, and you can't tell who said what. Then after writing the report, I go talk to my coaching client, and I say, Mr. Potential CEO, here's who I talk to. Here's what you're seeing is doing well. Here's what you are seeing is needing to do better. What do you think? The person says, yes, I feel good about this and this and this, and I want to get better at this and this. Next step, bring in the CEO. The CEO says, yes, I agree. This person is doing a good job here and here. needs to get better here and here. Then I ask the CEO a classic question. 
if this person gets better significantly at these behaviors as judged by these people, is it worth this much money, yes or no? If the answer is no, don't hire me. The answer is yes, you can't lose. The person gets better paying me, the person doesn't get better, it's all free. By the way, the lawyers love this, it's a big escape clause, only pay me if you feel like it. CEO says yes. Now we have a contract. Now what happens? The key to the success of my process is not me talking to my clients. The key to the success of my process is my clients talking to their coworkers. So now the client comes back and talks to the coworker and says, Mr. Coworker, thank you so much for the feedback. I really appreciate you participating. They communicate thankfulness. They're thankful for the good feedback. They talk about what the positives were and how grateful they are. Then the client says, here's something I want to do better. Please give me ideas. Feed forward, not feedback. They ask for ideas for the future. Now, I have also coached the stakeholders on how to help my clients. What advice do I have for the stakeholders? Number one, let go of the past. Now, whatever sins my clients have committed in the past, I can't fix and they can't fix. And if you bring up the past, you demoralize people. Easy theory, hard for some of us to do. Number two, tell the truth. Have everyone swear to tell the truth. I'm not naive. I know if they swear to tell the truth, they might not. They're more likely to. Number three, be positive and supportive, not cynical or sarcastic. And then number four, I say to the stakeholders, you pick something to do better too. So this is two ways, not one way. So the client comes back and says, I want to get better at this. Please help me. The stakeholder says, first, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate you putting in the effort. I want to do my best to help you. I'm going to give you ideas for the future. And then the stakeholder says, here's something I can improve. One of my clients, I was hired to coach one person and 200 people got better. Why? They're all trying to help each other, not judge each other. Now, my client has talked to everyone, all 18 people. Now, I go back and talk to my coaching client. I say, Mr. Coaching Client, who did you talk to? What did you learn? What are you going to do about it? Now, from here on in, for me, it's all feed forward. I say, now, I'm going to give you my ideas to help you do better. And then I say, it's feed forward from here on in. You don't have to do what I say. You do have to listen to what I say. And I don't want you to judge or critique my ideas. Just say thank you. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. I also tell my clients, I don't get paid because I'm a good coach. I get paid because you're a good customer. Don't make this about me. It's all about you. Well, what happens is they follow up, follow up, follow up with their people. I follow up, follow up, follow up with them. And then we do a simple measure. For example, minus five to plus five scale on each item. Has the person gotten better, gotten worse, stayed the same? And then we do a mini survey, follow up, follow up, follow up survey, follow up, follow up, follow up again, another survey. Now it's been about a year and a half. I go back to my client and say, here's the report. The client says, hey, you got a lot better at this stuff, judge by these people. Bring in the CEO. What do you think, Mr. Ms. CEO? CEO says, a lot better at this stuff, judge by these people, you should get paid. Can you see why I can give my clients a pay only for results guarantee? And can you also see why I almost always get paid? And can you also see why this is a transferable process? Most of what my coaching clients learn, they do not learn from me. They learn from everyone around them. I'm much more of a facilitator than an expert. I facilitate a process helping them learn from everyone around them. I'm a participant in the process. I'm certainly not the driver of the whole thing. Also, I never make the business case for my clients that this is important. They make the business case for me. I don't tell the CEO who the stakeholders are, they tell me. I don't tell them it's worth the money, they tell me. Everything in this process is driven from where? It's driven from inside the people I'm coaching. It is not driven from me. Changing behavior or changing perception? I'm often asked a question, do people really change their behavior or are they merely perceived as changing because they do that follow-up? Well, the answer to this question is kind of the opposite of what you might believe. It's much easier to change behavior than it is to change perception. 
One of the best research principles in psychology is called cognitive dissonance theory. Cognitive dissonance theory, what does that mean? Well, we all see people in a manner that's consistent with our previous stereotype. We all see what we think is there. We don't necessarily see what's there. We see what we think is there. Let me give you an example. Let's imagine that I think you're a bad listener. Well, once I have that stereotype, I'm going to look for bad listener in whatever you say and do until I find bad listener. Let me give you an even simpler example. Let us imagine your problem is you make too many destructive comments about other people. I picked that because it sounds so simple. You think that's easy to fix, just quit doing it. Not so simple. I'm your coworker. You go seven months and never make a destructive comment about anyone. Seven months later, you say, stupid SOBs in finance, idiot bean counters. How do we get any done in this company? It's run by a bunch of stupid accountants. I hear you. My first reaction is, he has never changed. Situation B, you talk to me. I'm your coworker. You say, coworker Marshall, I want to do a great job of being a good team player, not make destructive comments. Give me ideas to help me in the future. I don't believe you're going to change. I don't believe you're going to change. Everyone I coach, you know what I teach them? If you practice this good stuff when you start out, you know what's going to happen? Well, your coworkers are probably just going to laugh at you behind your back. They don't believe you're going to change. Then I always say, if you practice these good techniques at home, our family members won't laugh at us behind our back. They're just going to laugh in your face. Well, nobody thinks we're going to change. What happens, though, two months later when I do the follow-up and I say, you know, Mr. Coworker, it's been two months. I said I want to be a great team player, not make destructive comments. Based on the last two months, give me ideas for the next two months. Now what happens? The coworker goes, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. It's been four months. It's been four months. Good job. Keep it up. It's been six months. You know, to be honest, I didn't think you'd change at all. It's been six months. You've worked very hard. I'm proud of you. Keep it up. Seven months later, stupid SOBs in finance, idiot bean counters. The coworker says, you know, you shouldn't have said that. You went seven months without doing that. You say, you're right, I'm going to apologize. Situation A, did behavior change? Yes. Did perception change? No. Situation B, did behavior change? Yes. Did perception change? Yes. In leadership, it doesn't matter what we say. It only matters what people hear. And we all see what we think is there. One final little example. Next time you see a Roman numeral watch or clock, I'm going to ask you two questions. What does the 10 look like? And what's the 4 look like? Almost everyone says the 10, of course, is an X and the 4 is an IV. Look closely at the Roman numeral watcher clock. 98% of the time, the 4 is not an IV. It's four eyes. And almost nobody that owns the clock and looks at it every day can see what's there. Why? We don't see what's there. We see what we think is supposed to be there. Team building without time wasting. Now, I love this process, team building without time wasting. What I love about it is the title, team building without time wasting. The cost of my clients hiring me is their time. Every CEO I've worked with loves this process. Why? It is incredibly quick, it's efficient, and it works. What are the steps in team building without time wasting? First, get up in front of the team. Everybody has two separate pieces of paper. One. People are going to evaluate how well is the team doing on a 1 to 10 scale on two questions. Question number one is, how well are we doing in terms of working together as a team? Now, when I say that, that doesn't mean how much money we make, are we efficient, how effective is our team process, interaction, dialogue, communication with each other. And question number two, how well do we need to be doing? How important is teamwork for this team? Well, I've asked thousands of teams around the world this question. The average answer is, we are about a 5.8. We wish we were about an 8.7. Most of us don't feel our teams are working together as well as we hope they would be. Well, let's assume that you're doing this with your team and the team says we are a 5.8. We wish we were an 8.7. Simple. You say, great. Let's close the gap. How do we close that gap between 5.8 and 8.7? The next step in the process is every team member you say, write down two behaviors that if everybody in this team got better on these two things, it would improve the quality of teamwork. And they write down two behaviors. And these are typically common sense behaviors like listening, recognition, common goals, good things. They write down the behaviors. Then what happens next is 
You have everybody share the behaviors. You don't discuss people, you only discuss behaviors. And when you share those behaviors, the next step in the process is you say, okay team, let's prioritize. Work with the team to help the team come up with the one most important behavior that if everybody in the team got better at this one thing, it would improve the quality of teamwork. For example, let's say the team says, listen, we all need to listen better, fine. Now you practice feed forward. Every team member has a very brief one-on-one -on -one dialogue with every other team member that sounds like this. I'd say, Mr. Team Member, we are at 5.8 in terms of working together as a team. We want to get to an 8.7. Everybody's working on listening. Other than listening, please give me one or two quick ideas that if I did these things better, it would really help improve the quality of teamwork. What are the rules? Ideas for the future, no feedback about the past. Second rule, when you get the idea, you have to shut up, listen, take notes, and say thank you. You can't judge or critique. Positive, simple, focused, and fast. Positive, simple, focused, fast. What happens next? After about 10 minutes, every team member has talked to every other team member. You look at the team members say, now you have a list of things for you. Pick one. Each team member picks one key behavior for himself or herself. Now let's say in my case, I'm a team member, I pick recognition. Now we have a very simple three question follow up process that occurs about once a month. Every team member talks to every other team member about once a month in a process that sounds like this. Uh, Miss team member, uh, we're all trying to improve teamwork. We've all committed to be better listeners. Give me one idea based on last month to help me be a great listener next month. Two, my own area for improvement is recognition. Give me one idea based on last month to help me do a great job of recognition this month. And three, I just want to be a great team player. Give me one idea to help me be a great team player. Three ideas, thank you, thank you, thank you. Return the favor, three ideas, thank you, thank you, thank you. Follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up. And then a measurement at the end. As you can see what the measurement looks like, simple mini survey measure. You will get more long-term improvement in team building doing what I just described. Then you'll get chipping people off to the woods for a week where they can hold hands and climb trees and sing songs. Nothing really changes. Why? This process has follow-up, measurement, discipline, follow-up, measurement, discipline. One, it works. Two, it's incredibly efficient. Why? It does not waste time and it does get results.